Welcome. My name is Thomas Aldrich. I am a medical oncologist and clinical investigator, currently an affiliate professor at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. And I'm very excited to join you today to talk about the very important topic of prevention of cancers caused by infections. Globally, about one in five cancers is caused by an infectious agent, and there are important opportunities for prevention of infection-related cancers through application of vaccines and in treatment of infectious diseases. Some of the vaccines that have been um, developed for, to treat infectious diseases and that can prevent cancers as well include HBV or hepatitis B virus vaccines, as well as human papillomavirus vaccines. And Dr. Vic Sarsabudi will be talking about that in detail for cervical cancer prevention. Importantly, treatment of infections themselves may also prevent cancer. Globally, there are 37 million people living with HIV. And in people living with HIV, cancer is a leading cause of morbidity and mortality, especially when HIV is left untreated. Treatment of HIV with antiretroviral therapy not only helps prevent the spread of HIV to other people, but prevents the commonest HIV-related cancers such as lymphoma or sarcoma. Additionally, treatment of hepatitis C virus or HCV uh, may also lead to a decreased risk of liver cancer, which is a leading cause of morbidity and mortality. So there are a broad number of ways in which we can decrease infection-related cancers through the use of vaccines and treatment of viral infections. Perhaps the most important area of research in this field is the treatment of HPV or management of HPV for the prevention of cervical cancer. And I'm going to turn it over to my colleague and friend, uh, Dr. Vic Sashabudi, to talk about uh, this topic in general and some of the exciting uh, advances in the field. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ulrich. I appreciate the introduction to the huge burden of infection-associated cancers. And uh, as you said, I will specifically speak about some of the important work and the opportunities that exist for prevention of a virally mediated cancer, cervical cancer caused by human papillomavirus. Cervical cancer is a leading cause of cancer-related morbidity and mortality among women globally. Every year, over 600,000 women are newly diagnosed and over 340,000 women die due to this disease, with over 85% of the burden in low- and middle-income countries. Cervical cancer is caused by persistent infection with cancer-causing types of the human papillomavirus or HPV. HPV has a vaccine against it and therefore cervical cancer can be prevented through the use of the HPV vaccines. It can also be prevented by routine screening and early detection and treatment of precancerous lesions called as secondary prevention. Cervical cancer is highly preventable, yet it is not fully prevented. Over 13,000 women are newly diagnosed with cervical cancer every year in the United States, and more than 4,000 women died due to this disease. Over half of all new cases of cervical cancer are among women who have either never been screened or have been infrequently screened. Women in the screening eligible age can be screened with tests such as pap smears and HPV testing, which if shown to have any abnormalities, can be followed up with diagnostic confirmation by a colposcopy and a biopsy procedure. If the diagnostic procedure suggests evidence of precancer, it can be treated by removal such that any morbidity and mortality due to cervical cancer can be prevented through this screening and early detection pathway. The HPV vaccine is a vaccine for cancer prevention. It is recommended between the ages of 9 through 26 in either two or three dose schedules. Despite being available for over 15 years, uptake rates for HPV vaccines have lagged significantly behind other vaccines in these age groups. There are several efforts currently underway to address some of the challenges, including communication issues and overcoming vaccine hesitancy so as to improve uptake. 
Considering the significant opportunities for prevention and control for cervical cancer, the World Health Organization has launched an ambitious initiative focusing on eliminating cervical cancer as a public health problem with efforts to improve access to HPV vaccination and cervical cancer screening and treatment globally. I'll now focus on some of the efforts through the US National Cancer Institute on research on HPV and cervical cancer prevention through a very large 20,000 person study in Costa Rica. The NCI is studying whether one dose of the HPV vaccines works equally as two doses. A single dose regimen could significantly simplify logistics and pave the way for improved access for HPV vaccinations globally. The results of this study are expected over the next several years. The NCI is also focused on efforts to accelerate cervical cancer control through evaluation and applications of novel and affordable technologies that can improve cervical cancer screening and precancer treatment approaches. To address the higher burden of HPV-related cancers in people living with HIV, the NCI is also supporting networks such as the US Latin American Caribbean HIV HPV Cancer Prevention Clinical Trials Network or ULACnet focused on optimizing approaches to prevent HPV related cancers in this high risk population. The NCI is also expected to fund a new network called as Cascade that will focus on conducting pragmatic clinical trials to improve screening and preventive therapy for HPV related cancers in persons with HIV both in low resource settings globally, as well as settings with high disease burden and health disparities within the United States. Finally, I will end by highlighting NCI's Cervical Cancer Last Mile Initiative, a public-private partnership to facilitate regulatory approvals for self-sampling based approaches for HPV testing as alternatives to provider-based sampling for cervical cancer screening. Thanks, Vic, for a fantastic presentation. This is really exciting and important work, um, and it's great to see how new technologies and applications of uh, existing technologies to get to the last mile, as you say, uh, are uh, really um, hopefully going to decrease cervical cancer risk in, over time. I was wondering if you could talk a few minutes about some of the challenges of implementing these programs in the COVID pandemic and some of the approaches you've taken to um, persevere despite the challenges. So, Tom, thank you. I think uh, it's a very important point that you have highlighted. And as we all know, we are all fatigued now with COVID for the past two plus years has taken a huge toll globally in the US and elsewhere. Uh, we have had, like every other profession, like every other uh, healthcare system, uh, have had to adapt to the challenges due to COVID. Initially, in the first few months of the pandemic in 2020, we did see significant reductions in uh, cancer screening uh, uptake across the board. Uh, slowly, it has come, the rates have slowly come. Uh, to near normal, if not fully normal, uh, with the you know huge amount of efforts uh, across the country, across the world, by uh, taking utmost precautions and care, and then getting vaccinated and boosted with COVID vaccines, uh, has really resulted in at least some semblance of normalcy to operations that are uh, equally important for preserving and protecting health, such as cancer prevention. And so whether it is cervical cancer screening in clinics or going for other routine preventative uh, screening examinations, whether it's for breast cancer or colon cancer, uh, those all suffered uh, in the first few months of the pandemic are slowly with huge efforts from both providers as well as patients are coming back to normal, but with a lot of adaptations related to distancing and taking uh, personal protective uh, equipment uh, usages. Uh, I, I must say that, um, you know, this is not going to be a easy transition back. But one thing we have also observed is the opportunity that the COVID and pandemic threw for us for improving approaches like telehealth and remote monitoring and remote uh, visits 
that actually allowed some use of novel technologies and innovations in um, in in the way we do things to at least partially address some of the other um, health related interventions like cancer prevention and screening interventions but i know you have worked a lot in this area i wonder if you have any thoughts particularly for vulnerable uh, populations such as um, immunocompromised individuals how do you see uh, the care evolve over time and particularly in the covid pandemic era thank you i think you've uh, hit the nail on the head when you talk about the opportunities that exist when facing a challenge um, and i think about ways in which when we're doing work in vulnerable populations we're always trying to come up with smarter more efficient ways that are less dependent on expensive uh, interventions and it with the healthcare system so telehealth more vaccines easier screening um, easier approaches to screening i think are all things that are valuable and important parts of the existing research that you and others are doing um, in the US and internationally. So, so to me, that's important. I think it's always important to keep on the agenda chronic medical conditions in the setting of this type of situation and not lose sight of the importance of continuing cancer prevention efforts um, because the need for cancer prevention doesn't go away when we're addressing these other global um, infectious pandemics. So the, that, the, you know, I think the important thing to highlight is the importance to continue to put a high uh, importance on all of the work that's going on in cancer prevention. Yep, I couldn't agree more. And um, thank you very much for, uh, you know, discussing this really important uh, aspect of, of uh, care and research and, and uh, you know, prevention that we all need to keep in the back of our minds. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. Thank it's you. Thanks. It's great to talk to you, Tom. Yeah, it's same to you and thanks to Less Cancer for keeping this on the radar, so. Absolutely, ditto, thanks so much.